But today uh, we're going to be looking at the, at the book of Peter. We're in that series at the moment of looking at different aspects of First Peter and how does that apply to us and how can we use it. And so today I would like to bring our attention to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. And it's a short sentence, but it has tremendous power by way of words, and it has tremendous power if you understand what Peter is trying to say. So in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, it says this, it says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. Now there's a lot of scriptures that can make your heart have certain feelings, but I don't know, when I began to read this, and I've read it in the past before, and there's something about this that can have an airiness to it if you begin to listen to it. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. That's a powerful statement that Peter's making. And there's a clear image that he's wanting to create for us. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Is we're going to have a look at the enemy, the way the devil prowls for us as believers. He has one mission, and that mission is to corrupt the work of Jesus Christ, to corrupt the work that God has, is bringing to this world, and just as he was corrupted himself. And so that's his mission. And so today, I hope to give you a few pointers uh, to notice what is the enemy doing in my life, and uh, next is how do I overcome that? What does Scripture say about me overcoming the enemy that is trying to attack me? So we're going to have a look at that. But there's a big question that I feel needs to be sitting in your heart as I'm speaking, just to bring into context the enemy and your faith. And that question is this. How much confidence do you have in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? It's a big question to ask yourself, one which we should ask ourselves all the time. What is your confidence in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Not the church's Savior, not the world around us, not the worship music that we listen to and these amazing Christians that we follow online. What is my personal relationship with Jesus? It's a big question. When I go home at night and it's just me, what is my relationship with God? It's a big question. And we're gonna, you're going to see why in the context of the enemy now now. If you're sitting in your chair and you're saying, I can answer that confidently, then I have another question for you. What is your confidence in? Jesus has beautiful aspects of him and who he is and his relationship with you, but can you confidently say what it is that you're confident about Jesus Christ? If it was a question asked to you to answer in a split second, what would you do? Wait, I know for me, <laughs> I would panic first, <laughs> but there should be an answer that begins to develop in your mind about what is it that I'm confident in about my Savior, Jesus Christ. Because as we chat about the enemy, confidence is everything, especially if, he, if you come upon attack. So that is what we're going to be looking at today and the question that I want you to, to post in your mind. So let's just take an opportunity to pray together. So Father, we come to you, Lord, and we just say thank you. Thank you that we are privileged enough to hear your word freely. Thank you, Father, for your word itself, that you have given us such an incredible tool to have a personal relationship with you. Above all that you do for us, Father, you've given us the most precious gift, your words, Lord, your voice. You speak to us through your word. Father, everything that we know about the Christian faith comes from the Word of God, the Holy Bible. So we appreciate you, Father, and we value you so much for placing this beautiful book in our hands so that we may know you and, Father, that we may grow in relationship with you. 
So bless this time that we have together, Father. And I pray that the hearts of the congregation today may become aware of something in their life that they need to better themselves in, in becoming a great follower of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool, cool. I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I was journeying in my faith, and as I still journey in my faith, sometimes somebody's preaching to me about something, and I have no cooking clue who they're talking about. Am I, have you found yourself in that position? So now I'm asking you to relate to me and what I'm saying, but you have no idea at which what I'm saying or who I'm talking about. So there's, so there's many people sitting here today, so I would just love... Just, just, to, just to state a little bit about First Peter and what it's about, so that you don't just sit there thinking, Yo, where did this come from? Or who is this person? Because sometimes those thoughts can override, and then you might miss something that God is trying to say because you're still processing what is going on. And so just to give you a little bit of context around Peter, and also when I get told that there's a prowling lion walking around me, I want to know why and who told me that, and, and is this person really that important that they could say that? Um, but this person who wrote this is really important. His name is Peter. He was one of Jesus' closest disciples, in fact, within the 12. And he's addressing this letter to churches that are surrounding the Roman Empire. So at this time, the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire was at full blast, and they're busy uh, persecuting, and they're busy punishing anybody that has a faith in Jesus Christ, or even speaks about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must understand how troubling the faith of Christians are to a Roman culture or a Greek culture, because it's completely opposed to what they believe. Now, you can imagine all these apostles going out, beginning to develop churches and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And now there's all these cultures that oppose everything that they say. And so that's why Peter begins writing this letter. So he's encouraging those who are journeying and first time in the faith, what does it mean to really be a Christian? What does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And that's important for us to know. So when we read about a prowling lion, we can have a concept as to why Peter was saying this. So he was encouraging them in two basic things, to be faithful to God and what we're teaching you, and to be aware of what is going on around you and the principalities and authorities that are going to pull you away from the beautiful relationship that God has in store for you. Cool. So I hope that helps some of you in the congregation who might be thinking, what is First Peter and who is Peter? Because um, it, it's definitely a question that began to run in my mind as I began to, to grow in faith. So Peter describes the enemy as a devil, that, uh, the devil as a prowling lion. I've had the privilege a few times of coming face to face with a lion. And so today I'd like to use Peter's analogy and just elaborate it on it a little bit and just get the feeling of how a lion attacks. Because similarly, so he's using a lion because it's similar to the way the devil attacks you, is the same way a lion will attack its prey. So I've got seven quick ways that a lion attacks. And they're quite fascinating and quite interesting. So the first one, uh, and the most obvious, is that a lion loves to attack prey when it's at its most vulnerable. So to give you a picture, let's use a giraffe, because I think giraffes are just really cool and clumsy, and so they're easy to understand. So when a giraffe wants to drink water, it has to spread both its legs like this, and it has to stick its neck in, inside the water. So he puts himself in a vulnerable position. And most giraffes are killed around the watering hole. Why? Because they put themselves in a position of vulnerability, and a predator goes, perfect opportunity for me to make my attack. When there's a devil that is considered a prowling lion around, he's looking for parts of your faith that are vulnerable so that he can attack. Another way that a lion attacks is through patience and deceptiveness. 
So I don't know if you've ever seen a lion, uh, one of those pictures from National Geographic, and all you see is all this beautiful grass, and then there's these sneaky eyes hiding in the grass and these pointy ears. Now, a lion is very deceptive, so it hides within the bush, it blends in, and it's patient. Patient for what? A moment of vulnerability on the prey that it's seeking. Maybe it's a big group and they've noticed that somebody's coming astray from the group, and so it goes. Or maybe it's just a big group and someone's in a, in a bad position, and so if I attack, they'll all scatter. But it's quite interesting that a lion is very patient and very deceptive. Another way that a lion attacks is uh, that sometimes it just likes to attack its prey for fun. And that's a scary thought for me. Uh, my brother-in-law is a game guard, and he told me that uh, sometimes a lion just likes to attack for fun because it's bored, because it sees an opportunity, and it'll just go for fun. The enemy is quite the same. It's, he has a mission, and he's looking for something to play with, and it's never usually fun for us, but it's fun for him. This one, because we have latitude in the building today and we welcome them on stage, um, there's something about a lion that is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if you've had the, the privilege of sitting in the presence of a lion before. I have a few times in my life. Um, one time we were on a game drive and uh, the lion was probably about five meters from the, from the truck. It was dark and he was just waking up. And all I could hear was this grumble inside his voice. It wasn't even a roar yet, but it sent shivers down my spine. And I actually wanted to encourage the game. I was like, can we go now? Because <laughs> I, I thought this thing was all beautiful. And, but it, the more and more I sat there listening, the more and more its beauty would draw me close and close and close. Now, we took latitude to Cape Town. And on the way back from Cape Town, we stopped at, uh, at, a, at a lion park. And there was a lion that was in uh, rehabilitation. And so it was running up along and down the fence, and then it took a seat right next to the fence. Now, when I mean right next to the fence, like if, if probably my shoulder went to the end of my hand away from the fence, and it's just sitting there with its mane up and its head up, and it's just staring. And one of the latitude students comes and sits on the fence, about this far from the fence, and begins to stare this male lion in the eyes. And we're saying, I don't think you should do that. So this lion starts to growl, and the latitude student thinks, hey, um, this is amazing. There's a fence between me and this lion, and stares deeply into the lion's eyes. I am not joking. This young man got lost in the beauty of the lion's eyes. If you've ever had the privilege to see them, they are beautiful. And as he's staring, we're like, his name was Spare, not the Spare that works with us. It's a different Spare. Um, and we said, Spare, we think you should go. And he said, no, 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 this is so beautiful. I'm going to keep looking at him. And next thing you know, this lion grunts. <clears throat> and I promise you, this intern nearly jumped into the pen with the other lion <laughs> because there was about a meter space between the pens. And that was crazy. But it's kind of like the enemy too, a prowling lion. Sometimes his beauty and his nature brings us in. And the enemy is quite the same. It's deceptive. He comes and he looks beautiful and he presents himself well. Think about Adam and Eve when they saw the serpent. It was beautiful to them. Our, our culture says, ew, snakes. But actually snakes by their nature are actually very beautiful. They have different colors and shapes and they glisten in the sunlight. There's something about the enemy that sometimes make, looks so beautiful and we draw ourselves closer and closer and closer until we may get bit. Another way that a lion attacks is by simply being present. When I sat next to a lion or a lion came into the watering hole, you could see every single animal suddenly had attention because this lion is in the room or this lion is around the, 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 the watering hole. The devil's presence in our lives is often very obvious, but we're often laid back 
and we think it's just sitting by the watering hole and it's just relaxing. Another game drive I had to go on. You, you're journeying my safari trips here because it, it just was perfect. Um, another game drive we had, it was just that. This lion is just sitting beautifully next to the water. And all the animals around it are keeping one eye open, but they're watching this lion and they're carrying on their business. In a moment's notice, that lion could have taken any one of those animals out but they chose to stay within the presence of the lion. Much like us, the enemy we know is with us. The enemy is around us. And acknowledging its presence, we choose to rather stay with it than run from it or distance ourselves from it. Maybe that's you in your heart now. Maybe the prowling lion is within your reach and you know about it. You know the enemy that is right with you, the evil that is overtaking your life but you're staying in the presence of it. Lastly, a lion mostly attacks at night or at dusk when things are just getting dark and cool. Yes, every photo on National Geographic is in the daytime, probably because they're too afraid to take pictures at night. But lions attack mostly at night. So I don't know about you, but the enemy likes to feed off the darkness in our lives. The moments in our lives that are, that are weak and dark is where he likes to attack us the most, in our thoughts and in our hearts. So just like a normal lion, the devil prowls at night. But that night looks different to an animal for us. It's the darkness at which we're facing. So I don't know about you, but Peter's analogy of a, of a lion and in, in, the, in the context of an enemy is quite accurate, it's quite accurate, especially knowing that and the enemy is in pursuit of me as a believer, and if his mission is to corrupt the work of Jesus Christ, then I'm his target, and so these are the things that I need to watch out for in the way that he attacks. So beware of the enemy and the schemes that he has, but I have Another animal that the lion fears, that the lion actually considers an enemy, and that animal is a rhino, our beloved rhino. We all love rhinos, we're trying to save them, so uh, the, li- the rhino is a, a fierce enemy of the rhino, oh, the rhino, the rhino is a fierce enemy of the lion. So I just want to bring you back to the context of why Peter was written, Okay. There's a struggling happening among the churches to believe in Jesus Christ because they're being persecuted by those who don't believe in Christ that are not in the way. So there's a struggling and trialing time happening for these churches when Peter said that there's a prowling lion. There's evil happening all around them. There's things that are attacking them. Now I want you to think of a rhino. (laughs) What is your first thought when you think about a rhino? Hey, what about his body? What about his nose? Maybe you're looking at me saying, I look like a little bit about like a rhino without a horn. But uh, the rhino has a certain quality about it. So there's a personal nature to every animal. And the characteristics of a lion is this, is loyalty, ach of a rhino, is this, loyalty, aggressiveness, courageousness, and determination. Those are the four main characteristics of a rhino. And he is faithful to that. The rhino is faithful to that. So Peter is calling those who believe in Jesus Christ and stepped into a relationship with him to be faithful to him no matter what is going on around them. No matter what Rome is trying to do, no matter what Greece is trying to do or the Greeks are trying to do, stay faithful to me. No matter how much they persecute you, No matter how much you have to suffer, stay faithful to Jesus. So a rhino fits that faithfulness by being loyal, aggressive about its nature and what it wants, courageous in everything that it does, and determined to make an impact wherever it walks. So we too can look like a rhino because we have two aspects just like a rhino. We have a weapon and we have an armor. Arano carries that heavy armor, and it carries that weapon 
Often, actually, to be honest with you, the biggest weapon on a rhino is his teeth, not his nose, just letting you know that. But the nose is what's more scary, and we want to look at that. And, and we have an armor too. So in Ephesians chapter 6, isn't this the most famous scripture that we can read? And it says this, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 13 to 18. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So just like a rhino, we have an armor, and that armor looks like the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. There's an aspect of that armor that each of us are struggling with, and you know in your heart which one it is. Are you struggling with the truth? Or are you walking in the truth? Or are you avoiding the truth? You know what the truth of, the, of, of Jesus Christ is and the ways that he calls us to live. Are you walking in his ways? Righteousness means to be walking in the ways and keeping the commands that God has called us. Are you wearing the shoes of peace? Have you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that helmet of salvation? Have you got faith enough for when the enemy attacks? And are you confident enough in God's word to have a weapon to fight the enemy that attacks you? It's a big question to ask ourselves. I remember the first rugby match I ever played. And uh, I think because you guys think I looked like a rhino, I might as well share a rugby story with you. And uh, the first ever rugby match I played... Um, my mom told me I can't play. And she said, you're not allowed to go out there because you don't have a scrum cap, you don't have a gum guard, and you don't have shoulder pads. And so I said, but mom, please, I want to play. All the other boys don't have all that. And she said, no, you're not going out there unless you're protected. And so I was like, oh, man. So I didn't get to play that game. And so uh, the next week, she took me to go buy all the stuff so that I could play the next game. And she didn't just get me that gum guard that has one thing here. I had to have a gum guard that had both, both my teeth, both top and bottom were protected. So I looked like a fool on the field because I just had to breathe like this. <laughs> so imagine me chasing you down. <laughs> you, like a rhino. You. But it's kind of like the armor of God. We shouldn't be in a relationship with God and not considering the armor that he has given us to protect that relationship, especially because there's a prowling lion that's coming to devour. It may not be your day to day that he attacks you, but there will come a time that he will attack you. And have you got your armor ready? Are you walking in the armor of God? Big question to ask yourself. One last fact about a rhino, and this amazed me. Did you know that a rhino is nearly, not as, nearly as fast as a lion? So the average lion can run 55 to 65 kilometers per hour. Every rhino can run up to 50 kilometers per hour. So I don't know about you, you've got this tiny, beautiful cat. Okay, it's not so small, but compared to a rhino, it's tiny. It's agile, it can move, and they've got this rhino that can move just as quick. And the reason I'm telling you that is because the rhino has a defense mechanism. Before it attacks or hits back, it'll actually run away. This fierce, ferocious animal can squash a lion under its foot, pierce its side with its horn, but what does it do? It runs first. It's quite interesting to me. 
And if we read in uh, Psalms, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, it says this. It says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. The best thing we can do with the enemy is run away from him. With the temptations and the, the desires that he places on our hearts, run away from them. Don't entertain them. If you can help it, don't put up a fight. Don't put up a fight. Because you have Jesus Christ who has already won the battle for you. Don't be a hero. Jesus was the hero already. In all instances that you can, flee from evil. Flee from temptations. It's the best thing that you can do. But shelter yourself in the presence of Jesus Christ, in the knowledge of who he is. That is the strong tower at which you can fight with. It doesn't mean you can run and drop your armor. It just means that the first port of call for us to do in a, trial, a troubled or trialed situation is to consider Jesus and, and put him first. Because he is the source of our strength at which we fight with. So go to him first. Run to Jesus first in everything that you do. Now, as we read, uh, 1 Peter says this. It says, be alert uh, and of sober mind because there's a prowling lion. Now we jump across to the armor of God, another disciple of Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul, telling us about the armor. But within the armor and the, the explanation of the armor, it's actually quite beautiful that Paul says this. In addition to all of this, Take up a shield of faith at which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit at all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. But with this in mind, now he says, with all of these things in mind, be alert. The same way Peter said, there's a prowling lion, be alert. Paul also says, be alert. I think these guys who were closest to Jesus are trying to tell us something. So I had a look quickly at the Greek word, um, uh, be alert, just to see if they do link from each other, and they do. And it got me quite excited because I love Oreos, and the word matches with the word Oreo, so you can remember that. And, it's, and the word is Gregorio, okay? So now you'll always remember, because every time you eat an Oreo, you're going to be like, ah, oh, Gregorio, okay? And, uh, and that word simply means stay awake, stay awake. How often as believers are we, are, are, we, are we oblivious to what is going on around us and wonder why we get hurt or miss the picture or, 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 or struggle through things alone? Be awake. Paul and both Peter are saying, be alert, for what is happening around you because there's a prowling lion that seeks to take, uh, devour you and, and, and attack you. So with the thought of being alert, um, I decided to make an acronym because I thought that would be best to remember this for me. It was an acronym, so I'd like to teach that to you. And uh, the acronym goes like this. So they're saying stay, they're saying stay awake. So now I'm going to tell you to stay alert by breaking up the word alert. And uh, the first one is this. So if there's a way that you can combat this enemy and stay awake and be alert is this, is to be active, listening, exercising, remembering, and teaching. Uh, Phil had a great way of saying it, and he said I should say that active listeners exercise remembered teaching. Wow, Phil, Wow. And, uh, and so the, it goes like this. If you are active in Christian fellowship and community, you have a support around you. But stay in that. Stay in an active Christian community. In Proverbs chapter 27, ver, uh, uh, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Stay in fellowship and accountable to other believers so that you can journey with somebody else that believes what you believe in and helps you in what you believe. Be alert and stay alert by listening for the voice of God. 
Listen for God's voice. In John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Are you too busy for God? Or have you got an inch of your day to begin listening to him, speaking to him, and praying for him? Because often we run around so much and wonder why God isn't speaking. But maybe the question is, are we listening and that we believe that God is going to say something audibly and change our life. But he speaks in many ways. He speaks through people. He speaks through his word. He speaks through vision. There's so much that God speaks through. But we need to learn our shepherd's voice. Next up, you have to exercise faith and good works. We all know that faith, uh, uh, faith is the most important, but Good works without faith is dead, but so if you swap them, it's exactly the same, that uh, uh, faith is dead if you do nothing with it. If you're not serving God, then what is your faith truly? Because God calls us to serve his community. So get working for Jesus Christ. The, we've often heard that faith is like a muscle. You have to exercise it, but we don't often believe that. So you have to break a muscle down, exercise it, and that's so it can grow. So exercise faith and good works. Probably the most important, remembrance. This is what Jesus calls us to do all the time. And we're going to do it later in communion. And he calls us to remember. Remember all that God has done and all that he has promised for you. If you can think back to a moment where God has had you and you experienced him, it'll get you ahead of the enemy and can help you in the attack of an enemy. And lastly, teaching. Teaching of the word of God and the ways of God. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't read the scriptures, sorry. Uh, <laughs> exercising faith, uh, it says in Proverbs chapter three, verse five to six, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Faith comes by trusting the Lord, and so you'll exercise good works through faith in Him. For remembrance, John chapter 14, verse 26 says this, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And lastly, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 says this, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. The truth is that if you are not reading the word of God, you cannot forget something you don't know. So if you are not actively in the word of God, how can you forget the teaching that God calls you to remember? It's a big challenge. Because we do, we experience God through so many different ways. We come to church and we learn, but people, that's not enough. It's not enough to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You cannot forget his teaching if you're not in it. So get to know the word of God, dive deep in it, learn it each day. Whether it's a multitude of chapters or even just one verse, do not miss out on learning and growing with God through his word. So that's the challenge that I, uh, I want to extend to you today, is to go throughout this week and be alert for what the enemy is doing around you. But you cannot be alert if you're not exercising or if you're not active or if you're not listening or if you're not remembering or you're not even in teaching. The alertness that you're going to have to the enemy around you you may be the next one to be devoured. It's a big thought to think. But go back to that first question. What is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Because it'll lead you to being alert. It will lead you to knowing what that relationship looks like. Let's pray together. So Father, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you that you are a good God working in our lives and working in our hearts, Lord. We thank you that we have brothers in Christ that went before us, such as Peter, such as Paul, that could remind us, Lord, of, the, of your ways, that could teach us your ways, that could extend warning to us as believers. 
these guys extended a warning for the life that we are gonna live and that the enemy around us will try and take that life from us, will be deceptive in nature to take us away from our relationship with God. But Father, we know that you are much stronger, you are more powerful. And so Father, we ask you to come into our lives. Father, I pray for every single heart in this room today that they may come to know your name, Lord. But not just here on a Sunday, Father, but in everything that they do, that they would remember you. Father, that they would go home and read about you. Lord, that they would fall in love with the name Jesus Christ, the name that's above every name, the tower of refuge that we can run to in troubled times, that we can seek you. I pray, Lord, that each person puts on the armor of God, that they look at each piece of that armor and discover it for themselves so that they may walk in confidence in you, Father. Confidence in who you are and who you are to their lives. We pray all these things in your wonderful name. Amen.